live from KSAT 12, the night beat starts right now. It could be closing time. A neighborhood ready to fight back against a local former bar. Not sure what it is now. That story coming up, but first. Lots of talk about the border tonight, including at the White House, where President Joe Biden met with leaders of Mexico and Canada. That summit an annual tradition, but did not happen during the Trump administration. We're also covering businesses along the border and border security. Our Stefania Jimenez and Alicia Barrera covering all the angles tonight. Let's go first live to Stefania, who is in Laredo. Steph. So, Steve, immigration and trade, those were the two big topics that were discussed today uh, at the summit. The pandemic obviously affecting both, but now there is a sense that these things are changing. Where we are right now along the U.S.-Mexico border, we know that this has been open to non-essential travelers for the last 10 days. And so that brings us to immigration. The president of Mexico urging the U.S. to provide work visas to some of the people who are traveling through Mexico. But obviously that brings us to another concern that Texas Governor Greg Abbott has. He's concerned about undocumented immigrants crossing over into into the U.S. And so he's activated something called Operation Steel Curtain, which we see a lot of right now in uh, Eagle Pass. That's where our colleague Alicia Barrera has more. She was showing us how those shipping containers were lined up along the border in order to prevent undocumented immigrants from coming in. And here's her report. That's right, Estefania. The goal of the state is to prevent people from crossing over. Take a look at what they're calling the steel curtain. You have military vehicles, shipping container after shipping container after shipping container, soldiers standing by on the other end, also barbed wire. And we did speak to a lot of folks here at Eagle Pass, and those who did agree to speak to us say that they are in support of this effort. We told you about a group of people moving through Mexico back in October. That group of 4,000 dwindled to a couple hundred as they headed to Mexico City. Their final destination unknown. They left Tapachula after growing frustrated with a backlog in asylum cases in Mexico. Why do they have so many containers, you know, if they already have the barbed wire? Carmen Cervera is talking about the nearly 20 shipping containers lined up along the river in Eagle Pass. Governor Greg Abbott says Operation Steel Curtain is how they're preparing for migrant groups. But those groups are nowhere close, and many of them are just walking. That's why I came to see if it is the truth, because I saw it on the news. Operation Steel Curtain comes two months after thousands of asylum seekers arrived in Del Rio. Today, just west of the shipping containers, a family of five undocumented migrants crossed the river where Border Patrol caught them. We don't know if this family is trying to seek asylum. Some people who live in Eagle Pass say the law enforcement presence makes them feel safer. So now we wait and see what's gonna go on because uh, we have the defense, we have the soldiers protecting us here, so we're okay. There is another group of migrants leaving Tapachula. That group is made up of about roughly 2,000 people, but they're still near the border with Guatemala. Here in Eagle Pass, DPS troopers are involved with that operation and say they'll make adjustments as needed. Stefania, back to you. So back here in Laredo, what we're seeing is more of an optimistic tone when it comes to the border reopening to non-essential travelers. The businesses here are hoping that they're able to recoup everything that they've lost. Keep in mind that the border being closed to non-essential travel, that lasted for 21 months. We spoke with the South San Antonio Chamber of Commerce, and they're saying that during that time, South Texas took a $2 billion hit. And so now owners, shop owners here in Laredo, as well as San Antonio, are keeping their fingers crossed, hoping that now that the border is back open to non-essential travel, they're able to get back some of what they lost. It's very, very bad. Lots of merchandise, but few shoppers. That's what many shop owners in Laredo are facing. Their businesses just a stone's throw away from the border. So when the U.S. banned non-essential travelers like shoppers or tourists from crossing, it hurt their bottom line. Many didn't survive. Others did, but they're barely holding on. He puesto por mucho vestido porque como tengo tantos desde ahorita le he puesto especiales. That's something shoppers from Mexico are counting on. Nosotros vengamos a ver las ofertas y está bien que hayan abierto, bien por todos. 
Thing is, unlike Elizabeth Aguilera, many more people coming from Mexico are going directly into other big cities in Texas, like San Antonio, which is another two hours away. Businesses expect that to come in handy with holiday shopping kicking off. Uh, the lure of San Antonio is we have great retail shopping all over town, whether it's the south side, the north. Um, we also have entertainment options that they're going to take advantage of. In the meantime, shop owners in Laredo are staying positive. We are worried about it because now this bridge is open, so we have little hope it's going to be better. So let's see what happened. Yeah, they are waiting for things to get better. Now, U.S. Customs told us that some of the drivers who are crossing the bridge from Mexico into the U.S. are waiting two hours. Keep in mind that the inspections are taking longer because U.S. Customs is also checking to make sure that the people who cross are indeed vaccinated. But here's the thing. So I told you two hours for some wait times, but hold on because Black Friday, right, it's eight days away and we're expecting to see a surge of, in, uh, of an increase in traffic during that time. They're saying, U.S. Customs is saying that they expect some people to wait in line up to four hours in order to get to the U.S. But remember, a lot of these people have been going stir crazy since they haven't been able to come to the U.S. for 21 months. So for them, it's well worth the wait. We're live here in Laredo tonight. Stefania Jimenez. KSAT 12 News. Steve, back to you. It's Stephanie, a very interesting comments and very interesting how we're seeing two very different scenes play out roughly two hours from each other along our southern border. Thank you for those reports today. By the way, our coverage continues online at KSAT.com. You can catch any of the reports you may have missed. That's where you can also find the very latest updates. Shots fired first led police there this morning, but police living off Drexel and Hackberry say it's not the only disturbance in that area. They point to the night team's John Paul Barajas that this building, they say it's become the site of after hour parties. Party after party, yeah, that's what they're doing. We hope we'd like to get, to get that corner fixed. It's coming from them, yes. On camera, you see cars parked and they walk over there. Those who live off of Drexel and Hackberry say they've had enough. They're constantly calling police to report activity happening at one building on the corner of the street. Explaining come 2.30, 3 a.m. after bars close, the crowd of people here starts to show up. If you come at 3 or 4 in the morning, you'll see both sides of the street. You'll see people all in the back, all in that parking lot over there, just hanging out, drinking. At around 3.30 this morning, there was a call for a shooting. Police tell us two men were walking when a car opened fire, hitting one of them in the legs, two homes, and at least one vehicle. This little point right here yep. is where you patched it. Yeah, and it came off the top. Police haven't made an arrest, don't know why the shooting happened, or if it's connected to the establishment residents say it is. It sounded like it was right there by my window. I mean, it was loud. Bah, 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 bah. I said, God. And it was between seven and eight gunshots that I heard. I immediately ran inside because I didn't want to be out in the open. According to police records, since June 18th, there has been 21 service calls for shootings around this location. There was a house whose front window has been shot out. Is somebody in my family going to be shot by these random shootings? In total, 73 calls have been made in that time which have included fights and disturbances. There's even video of a man using a residence yard as a restroom. Neighbors say that man came and returned to that building. Went to the side of my house, squatted, did his business, then went to my garden hose and cleaned himself off. Uh, it's frustrating. It's more frustrating than I think any other emotion that I can feel. Neighbors say that building used to be a bar called Twin Sisters Cantina. We reached out to the property owner there, but haven't heard back yet. Police say they're working with that bar to try and solve the issues they're having. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. Let's hope we get some answers to all that. Thank you, John Paul. Right now, take a good look at your screen. Investigators say this man is accused of sexually assaulting two girls. Police released a surveillance photo of him appearing to be driving a BMW sedan. Officers also released a close up photo of that man. If you know who he is or where he is, call SAPD's special victims unit at 210-207-2313. You can also take a closer look at these images, by the way, on our website, ksat.com. A home break in can leave anyone unsettled. So imagine what dozens of students at UTSA are dealing with after a security breach at one of their dorms. Investigators trying to figure out how someone got a hold of a master key and slipped inside multiple students' rooms.
I am a little concerned. They have, I was like, okay, that's a little iffy. So that's a bit scary. Like, I don't know if someone's been in, makes you wonder. Yeah. yeah. Some students say they are now using chairs and door stops to block their doors. University police say they are increasing patrols. Resident assistants are also adding more building checks. Master keys are now reprogrammed and the way they're stored is different. UTSA police say they found several of the items stolen during these burglaries. As for any arrests, well, police did not answer that question. It's still ahead on the night beat the one week countdown off for Thanksgiving. While that may have helped this business, one local turkey farmer says it's not the only reason he's seen success in sales lately. And they're known for their signature red kettles. But did you know you can get paid to become a bell ringer for the Salvation Army? How you can apply and what they pay next on the Night Beat. You know how it is. You probably hear them before you see them, but that might change this year. There's a shortage of bell ringers for the Salvation Army this year. Brad Mayhar says while there are volunteers, there are also paid bell ringing positions available. You can apply by visiting their office or calling 210-352-2000. With less people ringing bells, that means less money the Salvation Army is likely to raise. Just so people know where that money goes, all that money stays here locally to help local programs. So it's a, it's a huge loss for us. By the way, Salvation Army bell ringers can make approximately $10 an hour. The Salvation Army also looking for volunteers, of course. If you'd like to apply for volunteer positions, you can also visit their website. Have you purchased your Thanksgiving turkey yet? Heritage turkeys becoming a hot item for a first generation livestock farmer in Fredericksburg. The night team's Patty Santos reports he's tapping into a trend that was actually amplified by the pandemic. As you can see, animals that roam the property. Out at Rome Ranch near Fredericksburg. We raise bison, turkeys, laying ducks, laying chickens, broiler chickens. Taylor Collins has found a way to build an oasis for the animals, his family, and his community through an organic livestock farm. A big passion for us was to restore and rehabilitate degraded land. Many times it's old farmed land. His hot commodity right now are his heritage turkeys. You probably have never had one of these birds in your life. There's 300 million industrial double-breasted birds grown everywhere in the United States. Uh, there's only 30,000 of these. There's also ducks, pork, and bison. Colin says there's a hunger for people to eat and buy local. It's been a trend magnified by 2020. We sold a lot, a lot more meat than we've ever sold. But even before the pandemic and supply chain issues, people were already turning towards organic foods. A study by the Organic Trade Association showed U.S. sales in the last decade more than doubled. Organic food sales grew by over 12 percent, reaching over 56 billion dollars. Collins is a huge advocate for land stewardship and preparing the ground for the next generation of organic farmers. We can't do that without the consumer. The consumer votes with their dollars for which agricultural system will prevail. Overall, organic food prices are higher than conventional food prices, but a study by Magnify Money found prices could be narrowing. Conventional food costs are rising more quickly than organic foods. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. And there is another tip that Patty Santos found out buying at local farmers markets and joining a community supported agriculture group or a CSA could help keep your costs down. Well, I'm just uh, I'm very happy to be here this morning. In fact, I'm very happy to be anywhere, to be perfectly honest with you, the way the last <laughs> couple of years has gone. Is that voice and face familiar? It's golf analyst, talk show host and author David Faraday. He's in town and was in town this morning in support of a San Antonio program that gives homeless veterans and those in need the gift of sight. I care San Antonio at Haven for Hope and their all star eye care program provide complete eye care to veterans and their families. That's what this breakfast was all in support of. Faraday, who was once a professional golfer, can be heard on CBS talking about the game he loves. But he's also a passionate military advocate and has gone overseas to entertain the troops. I went to Iraq first in 2006. Um, I grew up in Northern Ireland um, in an urban wars, war zone uh, in the 60s and 70s. So I, I've been surrounded by soldiers and sailors and airmen and Marines my, my whole life. Um, and I have an affinity uh, towards them. 
It's a very nice man. I was honored to MC this breakfast this morning. There is a need for eye care for veterans in this state. Texas has the highest number of uninsured veterans and the third highest number of homeless veterans in the country. Sky 12 tonight out and about as we look at the Tower of the Americas and for those of us who've been waiting to turn on the heater, we may have to break down tonight, Adam. Uh, if you've been putting it off, you might break down tonight, but your house may have warmed up enough during the day. To... Put another blanket on. There you go. That's what you can do. That's what I prefer. <laughs> when you wake up and it's like, ooh, hard to get out of bed. I love that feeling. I do want to point out, we do have the partial lunar eclipse tonight, starting shortly after 1 a.m. And we're going to be feeling the chill tonight. And first thing tomorrow morning, it's back to the jackets, long sleeves for the kids at the bus stop. Rain possible by Thanksgiving, a shift in our weather pattern. We're going to get into that as well. First, I want to start with the partial lunar eclipse, nearly a total lunar eclipse. This is when the Earth passes between the moon and the sun and casts its shadow upon the moon starting at 1 18 a.m. And this is an unusually long lasting eclipse. It's going to be at its maximum at 3.02 a.m. So if you want to set your alarm a little before 3 a.m., go for it. Then you can go outside, look up, find the moon, and you'll see the sh Earth's shadow cast upon it. And it comes to an end uh, shortly before 5 a.m. And I do have um, a post that's a push that's going to be going out to the weather app, a quiet one that'll be going out for folks that want to go see it to remind you a little after 1 a.m. in case you want a reminder. But the clouds are pretty stubborn west of San Antonio. It's going to be hard to see that partial eclipse along the Rio Grande and locations west of town. That's actually where we've had some showers even just over the past few hours southwest of town. Decent rainfall uh, between Catula, Tilden, Choke Canyon there uh, earlier today with that cold front as it moved through. And by the way, we will have some low and mid level cloud decks coming and going overhead locally uh, through the night. So that may impede the viewing just a little bit of that lunar eclipse. Just have some patience if you're going to be up for that overnight tonight. Storm tracks still across the northern US. It's good to see the moisture out west. They need it. They're getting more of it. Our weather pattern, however, is likely to shift as we get into next week. Quiet through the weekend. By Monday, we start focusing on the eastern Pacific. Two big disturbances coming together and right now, Odds favor this coming together as one disturbance into northern Mexico. That would put us in the position of good energy, Pacific moisture, and favorable rain chances by Thanksgiving. I know the timing may not be optimal. However, these cutoff upper level lows are very finicky in the long term. Right now we have it at 40%. I promise you we'll be changing the rainfall potential and exactly who and where and when is going to get the most amount of rain. But there is the possibility of some heavy rain in parts of Texas starting Thanksgiving. So we will keep you updated. You want to check back in. 70 was our high at midnight today. We were in the 60s all afternoon. 56 right now. We have some 40s already in parts of the hill country. And tomorrow morning, we're anticipating temperatures low to mid 40s for most of us. I think some upper 30s in parts of the hill country. Meanwhile, closer to 50 along the Rio Grande. So starting the day in the 40s by the afternoon, we make it well into the 60s with some sunshine, low humidity, 70s by the weekend, and then temperatures reset a little bit with what we're watching. Thanksgiving. Check back in for more detailed updates. All right. Thank you, Adam. All right. Boy, this game did not start off well. They fought back and didn't end well. It didn't end well. And yeah. you know, right now they lost every game on this road trip. They lost their last home game, so they're on a four game losing streak that ties for the longest of the season. It could very well be five starting on Monday because then they have to host Phoenix when we come back. The wrap up this road trip did not go well. And big game playoff coverage tonight in high school football coming up. Jakob Perto back in the lineup with the silver and black tonight. Minnesota are missing seven games in the league's health and safety protocol. Spurs were as cold as a Minnesota winter, shooting one for their first 12. The T-Wolves, on the other hand, as hot as a San Antonio summer. They jumped out to a 22-3 lead. This Carl Anthony Towns three puts Minnesota up 20. Spurs start to chip away in the second. Devin Vassell for the three gets the Spurs within 10. Then Vassell from 16 feet out gets a friendly bounce, a four-point game. But the Wolves in the half on a 9-2 run. Towns gets this to fall at the buzzer. The Spurs are down 11 at the 
at the break. So second half now. Spurs trying to claw their way back into this one. DeJounte Murray, Keldon Johnson, the corner for the three. Lead is down to nine. Devin Vassell was a lone bright spot for San Antonio tonight. First to pull up three from the wing. Then Vassell gets the steal, and he takes it back for the two-handed punch. He led the Spurs with 18 points tonight, but the Spurs would still trail by 15 going into the fourth. Keldon Johnson with a dozen. So did Lonnie Walker. It wasn't DeJounte Murray's night going two for 12. For just seven points, the Spurs fall 115 to 90. Like I just told my teammates, we talked to the plane, the buses, the locker room, outside of our job. And when we get on the floor, it's like everybody's scared to talk to each other. You know what I mean? So, you know, it's, it's a lot of fixable things. Uh, and this is going to start with us. All right, next up, Phoenix on Monday at 7.30. As their San Antonio Spurs wrapped up their three-game road trip tonight, Minnesota back here at home. The Spurs' top brass is on hand for groundbreaking ceremonies at the new Spurs State-of-the-Art Performance Center. It's all part of a $500 million legacy project called the Rocket Lock and Terras in Pounding the Rock that will extend across 45 acres and feature a human performance research center, a 22-acre park, a public outdoor event center, and medical hospitality and office use. Today's ceremony officially opened phase one of the project, which is the Spurs' performance. Performance Center. Having a foundation and a place where players can come and be their best self and reach their potential is what we have to have. It's table stakes now to compete. And so having this uh, will absolutely ensure that our legacy of winning continues. All right, here we go. Big game playoff coverage tonight. Southwest Legacy Titans had the work cut out for them this evening, going up against Gregory Portland. Second round of the 5A Division II playoffs. The Wildcats bite first on the Titans' six-yard line. Play action fools the defense. Quarterback Brandon Redden rolls out and finds Ross DuBose open in the flat and jogs into the end zone. 7-0 Wildcats, and they're not done. Next possession, Redden to DuBose again. This time on the hot route, DuBose races in from 15 yards out, 14 and nothing. Final from the Alamo Dome, 55-13 Gregory Portland. Beville Jones Trojans and Pleasanton Eagles meet at midfield before tonight's second round game of the 4A Division I playoffs. Trojans get the ball first, but not for long. The fumble, the snap, and Cade Mitchell falls on it. The Eagles take over. Eagles running back Joel Aravalo busts through the line, and it's a foot race to the end zone. Look like he's going to score, but gets taken out inside the 10-yard line. But the very next play, Aravalo again. This time he finds the end zone for Pleasanton. The 7-0 lead, the final from Eagles Stadium. Look at that. Hold on for the victory, 21-20. From our neighbors to the west, Eagle Pass, CC win going up against their biggest playoff challenge against Flower Bluff from Corpus Christi, Class 5A Division I postseason. Horn is up 30 to nothing in third, continue to sting. Quarterback Nash Villegas going deep over the middle to a wide open Christopher Geiswhite in the end zone. 38-yard score makes it 37 to nothing. The final from Hero 47-7, Flower Bluff. And here's a look at the KSAT 12 and the Texas Sports Production broadcast schedule. The Vandergriff Steel game will be on 12.2 for you. That is live from start to finish. And there you see the rest of the TSP streaming games on the BGC after the rest of the night, including Central Catholic against Fort Worth All-Star States. A big send-off at Brandeis High School today. Next. The undefeated 15-ranked UTSA Roadrunners facing the biggest football game in school history when they put their unprecedented 10-0 season on the line against defending Conference USA champion University of Alabama at Birmingham for the Conference West Division title. If the Roadrunners win, they will host a Conference USA championship on Friday, December 3rd in the Alamo Dome. Down today was announced that senior quarterback Frank Harris will be introduced before kickoff Saturday as far as senior day. And junior running back Sincere McCormick have been named the semifinalist for the Earl Campbell Tyler Rose Award, given out to the top offensive player in college football with ties to Texas. Big send-off today at Brandeis High School as the Broncos volleyball team headed to stay for the first time in school history. They face Bridgeland tomorrow at 5 in Garland in Class 6A state semifinals. What a turnout. It's been crazy. All the signs this last week, it's just weird seeing all of volleyball signs everywhere and random people you don't even know, people younger than you, people older than you coming up and saying, oh my God, congratulations. Our boys basketball team went to state a couple years ago, but it was COVID. So we didn't get to do all these things for them. And so now that everybody's here, I think admin's excited, our community excited. Good luck to Brandeis and Canyon Navarro. All the highlights for tomorrow afternoon. I love that video. It's great. We'll be right back.